I'm offering you a choice to fight with knives or guns. But just remember this. Whichever way you choose, the loser will be a long time dead. Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Mr. Paladin! Mr. Paladin! Uh, over here, hey boy. Oh, uh, Mr. Paladin, message. Oh, thank you, hey boy. Mr. Paladin. Yes. Oh. How do you do? Badly. Hmm? In the future, when you send a note to a lady, kindly instruct the waiter not to hand the note to the lady's companion. I apologize. Perhaps I can recompense you in some way? Uh, Mr. Webster, one answer? Uh, uh, tell him my price is $1,000, hey boy. Madam, it has caused I... me the most dreadful kind of embarrassment. Well, I am indeed sorry, madam. If you will allow me... I already me to... told him $1,000. He actually insisted that I was flirting with you across that entire dining room last night. It was ridiculous. You were the soul of decorum. Webster said what, hey, boy? Oh, uh, he turned red like a stove, but he said he'd pay. Oh, good. He forbade me to ever communicate with you again. That's bad. The gentleman is your husband? Certainly not. Well, that's good. But we'll have to show him, you and I, that absolutely nothing occurred to cause him to act this way. Of course. Well, what time may I pick you up for dinner? Eight o'clock. Always a good hour. Until then. Oh, boy. Ah, what I tell uh, Miss Webster? Oh, tell him I'll find out why three of his riders have been waylaid on open rangeland, and I'll do what I can for him. Oh, yes, uh, I have gun wheel travel. Exactly. <laughs> The trail to the Brazos River is a long and lonely one, and it took ten days hard riding to get there. Once I was there, it was nothing but brackish, muddy water, the product of an unfriendly nature. A mile beyond, the trail sloped up into the rocks. It was hard going. Hold it right there. Man's on your left, man's on your right, and I'm here. Them's your eyes. Unbuckle that gun belt, let her drop. Climb down. Now, don't wiggle a hair. Boys. Yes, sir. You stand behind him, Pete. Yes, sir. Mister, can you see that sign? Yeah. Then read it. Closed range, keep out. O'Banion Ranch. You crossed. This is open range according to the map. Well, according to me, it's open when I say it's open. You boys can have his clothes and horse. I'll just take a gun. It, hey, he's got a derringer. Get him, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> He don't talk so tall now, does he? One of you ought to be able to split wood and fetch water. We take orders from Cyrus Cookie. Good morning. Is this the O'Banion Ranch? Well, I declare. Look at the wind blew in. I have some business with whoever owns this ranch. Move on, fella. Next ranch is 20 miles. No hand out here. I want to see the owner. Maybe we ought to let him see the owner. If he takes a bath first. Owner here is kind of persnickety about dirt. Water trough beats him. Go up! Get me out of here! 
You think you're pretty smart. And you're dirtier than he. If I get out of here, I'll, I'll turn you both. Well, I declare, mister, didn't look like there was much man under them raggedy clothes and all. Here, you can't go in there. I'm looking for a banyan. I'm Miss O'Banion. I own this ranch. I told him not to come in, Miss Margaret. Is this one of our men, Cookie? No, ma'am. Just drifted in. I see. That's quite a collection of guns, Miss. Collecting guns happens to be my foreman's hobby. I know. He collected mine. I'd like to meet your foreman. Well, then come back in a week. Cyrus and his range crew left this morning on a cattle drive. I could use some kitchen help now, Miss Margaret. With Cyrus gone, I can't get help out of the hands. Well, then hire this one if you wish. But see that he takes a bath and put him into some clean clothing. Say, let me put a question to you. How much do you appreciate the things that make life just a little easier? Like living any place you've, you've a mind to. Now, according to our Constitution, if we don't like where we live, we can move to any other state we want to. All we have to do is hop in our car or take a train or a plane, and off we go. And when we get to where we're going, there's plenty of stores and shops and tradesmen to help us in our new home. But let's go back a spell to 1790 and see what happened then when folks got the urge to move. If you were living back then, you'd maybe pick up a copy of the Providence Gazette, and you read an article called Advice to American Farmers. It tells all about moving out west, which is western Pennsylvania and Ohio in 1790. It says if you're moving, you'd better take along some apple, peach, and garden seeds, a kettle for boiling, maple sap, and of course a gun and plenty of ammunition. You should also have a Bible. Other folks moving west in 1790 took along maple saplings to plant or homemade tools they could use to build boats when they got there. Boats were about as important as horses in 1790. Most of the towns were built inside a fort, since the Indians didn't specially like all this pioneering that was going on, and guns and ammunition were worked overtime. And Indians weren't the only ones who gave folks trouble. There was plenty of bear and wolves and other wild animals to keep folks on their toes. But somehow, in spite of all the fuss and bother of moving into a new community, folks in 1790 didn't complain. They just kept working and fighting, so living it'd be easier in the future. The future you're now protecting. When a man is stripped of his horse, his saddle, and his guns, his problems become simple. He must have food and a place to rest. Once those things are attained, he can go about the job of retrieving his lost property, even if the job of washing dishes and serving meals comes first. Here, you stay out of that stew. Mm -hmm. Well, a man can get... Mighty hungry around this place, working in the kitchen. I've been watching you. You ain't no saddle bum. Just who are you, mister? Would you believe me if I told you I was the oldest son of an English nobleman? Well, not hardly. A little callus on your thumb there. Wouldn't be from a gun hammer, would it? It might, Cookie. You're here after someone or something? Tell me about the foreman, uh, Cyrus. Give me that other pot there. All right. Cyrus runs the whole ranch for Miss Margaret. Has ever since her folks died. Why doesn't she run it? She's a lady, you could see that. Drinks tea and reads poultry books all day. You're still an O'Banion. Pour in them peel potatoes. You know, Cookie, puzzles me. This kind of range should support thousands of head of cattle. On my way here, I didn't see 20 steers. Well, maybe you didn't look good. Cyrus does a good job for Miss Margaret. She don't have to turn a finger. Pretty hard thing not to turn on a ranch this size, even if you are the owner and the lady. Would you want somebody like her out there mixing with this ranching crowd? Like Jake and them others sitting outside now waiting to pay you back for dumping them in the trough? Or is somebody like her better off inside with her tea and poetry? Nothing wrong with tea and poetry, Cookie, but it's not a substitute for living. You carry a tray into her now. All right. And you be polite, you hear? All right. Tea? Thank you. Will you pour, please? One lump or two. 
One, please. I probably should say I think that you've done very well so far. Thank you. But breakfast was served quite expertly. You, uh, you show considerable household ability. Would you kindly stop staring at me like that? Yes, ma'am. A good servant tries to be as inconspicuous as possible. Yes, ma'am. The, the books on the mantel, please bring them. Yeah, of course. Tennyson or Shelley, ma'am? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. But it does. I recommend this one. Shakespeare. Well, I think he's very common. In certain passages, maybe. He deals with common ideas, but in words of uncommon beauty. Really? And uh, are you a, a poet? No, but I've read some. I see. You may go. As you say. Oh, I've drawn up a list of odd jobs for the men. Hard work always improves ranch discipline. You've drawn up a list? Mm -hmm, yes. Well, I understand you're in some difficulty with the men. <laughs> Nothing that can't be straightened out. Oh. Well, in that case, please feel free to... to oversee things. Thank you. Uh, Paladin. Yes, ma'am? I hope they thrash you within an inch of your life. <laughs> We'll be back to our show in just a minute, but first, this message. You know, our servicemen overseas have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. They find, too, that these ideas aren't so strange after all. For instance, take this business of tattooing. On some of the islands of the Pacific, the natives adorn themselves with tattoo marks indicating the group they belong to or the gods they worship. Among the Brahmins and Mohammedans, a tattoo is used as a mark of caste although the caste system is rapidly disappearing. In Japan, skilled artists create truly beautiful designs using the human body instead of a canvas. Well, all this might sound strange, but tattooing is not unknown in our culture. However, as some of our servicemen have observed, it's, uh, well, it's a little embarrassing when a fellow with a tattoo that reads, John Loves Mary, takes as a wife a girl by the name of Josephine. Or the young man with a beautiful anchor on his chest finds himself in the Army or the Air Force. From another standpoint, the beauty marks worn by some women of Western civilization are nothing more than a form of tattoo. And the same thing is true about other customs and traditions of all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. These customs are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing the customs of other people in other lands. No, no, no. Any of you others want to take it up? Not me. Oh. And all of you can get to work for a change. Oh. You. Cookie needs water. Hop to it. Yes. And you. Oh. Firewood on the double. Oh. Half cord by sundown. Oh. You. In the barn, curry those animals. Yeah. Now, the rest of you, there's enough work for all hands around here. If you can't find any, let me know. I'll find it for you. Now, hop. What about me? You and I are going to check the feed and water conditions, Jake. Any objections? So long as I can't whop you, I'll ride with you. That's about the size of it. What do you think? Lots of grass. Plenty of water. Everything but cattle. Does Miss O'Banion know there's not even breeding stock left out here? She knows what Cyrus tells her. No more. Oh. Go on. He even makes sure we don't get visitors through here poking around, asking the kind of questions you're asking. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Does he keep any sort of records? Feed bills, ledger book in the barn. 
If you're going to buck Cyrus and his range crew, don't count on much help. Well, I'm going to count on you for one thing, Jake. Those books. I want to look them over. Now, wait. Ah. Miss Margaret. What's she doing out here? Ain't seen her on horseback since she went away to that fancy school. Uh, go on back, Jake. I'll be right along. Yeah, sure. Give her Paladin. Oh, I'm glad you happened along. My saddle seems I to... didn't happen along. What? You knew I was riding out here. You circled ahead to this point, then you dismounted, loosened the cinch here. How dare you speak to me that way? Well, it's time somebody spoke to you some way. What are you talking about? You. Uh... Now, this is the first time you've ridden your own ranch. I've never seen you look prettier. Even the britches are becoming. A gentleman would never... You know, you ride very well. I suspect when your parents' backs were turned, you used to slide out the window and pick out a horse and ride bareback. Well, what if I did? And between embroidery practice and elocution lessons, you even dreamed about running your own ranch. Out here, that'd be normal for a boy or a girl. And I could run one, too. Then why don't you? I, uh, well, I'm a lady. Anyway, I, I wouldn't know where to start now. Then start by being honest. With yourself first. For example, why did you ride out here? What did you want? Honest? Yes. I wanted to come right up to you and say, stop calling me ma'am. I know you're not really hired to help you. You have a way of, 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 of upsetting me every time that you walk into the room. That might be dangerous for a lady. You said to be honest. Well, I'm a woman, too. In a week, I intend to be a thousand miles from here. Oh, Paladin. I think we'd better ride back, Miss O'Banion. We wouldn't want to get caught out here after dark, would we? On July 30th, 1619, the first representative assembly in America met in a log church in Jamestown, Virginia. The small group of men who comprised the House of Burgesses were America's first lawmakers. Initially, the assembly had only one chamber. Then, around 1680, an upper chamber was added, and Virginia's legislature had two houses. A century later, the concept of a two-chamber legislature was carried over to the United States Congress and resulted in the formation of the Senate and the House of Representatives. For almost 300 years, this type of legislation has been an important characteristic of American democracy. From the contributions of the past come the principles of the present. The ranch is pretty quiet. I wonder where everyone is. Isn't it supposed to be this way? Just you and I. We're the only ones left on there. Alan! Jake? Cyrus is back. Where? In, inside. What can I do? Well, that depends on Miss O'Banion. She is the boss here. Oh, but... Uh, Are those the ranch books? Yeah. Give them to me. Maggie, you're broke. Broke? Your range is stripped clean. Cyrus has the power to sign loans, and he's used it. Oh, no. W what'll I do? You'll help yourself or you'll lose the place. Well, well. Cyrus. Wondered where everybody was. I see you've been going to a lot of trouble. My books, huh? That's right. I wouldn't worry too much about them. See, what's to worry about are these notes I hold right here. Notes? That's what I was going to tell you. Cyrus obligated this ranch to several loans. Sold your cattle, pocketed the money, and used the money to buy the loan papers back. All I have to do is demand payment. Oh, and speaking of debts, mister, don't you owe me something from our first meeting? I was coming to that. Now, wait a minute. I just collect guns. I don't use them. Now, it's your move. <laughs> uh, fine. It's just what I wanted you to do. Watch his knife, Mr. Paladin. And now it ain't murder, is it? 
Just self-defense. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna cut you open like a pumpkin. Hold it. The next bullet won't be wasted on the air. Put that knife down or I'll kill you, Cyrus, right where you stand. I'd do it if I were you, Cyrus. Maggie O'Banion's taking over. The knife, Cyrus. Drop it. Now, those notes, please. You can't Yes, do I can. Now, get off my property. She means what she says. How'd they do, Paladin? Fine, Maggie. Fine. What are you doing back in San Francisco? Waiting to see you. I think that's horrid. I just managed to get Roger straightened around to where he's decent to me again, and now you show up. Would you rather I left again? He's terribly difficult. What did we do the last time he became difficult? We went out to dinner and had a perfectly charming evening. Then may I suggest that we do the same thing again tonight? Eight o'clock is always a good hour. Until then, dear lady. Until then. <laughs> Have Gun, Will Travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hayboy. Tonight's story was written by Gene Roddenberry and adapted for radio by John Dawson. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Harry Bartell, Barney Phillips, and Virginia Gregg. Hugh Douglas speaking. Have Gun, Will Travel is brought to you through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.